guys with us from Blackside. Um, let's start off with Tom. Tell everyone who you are and your involvement in the film. I am Tom Payton, the writer-director of Blackside, so pretty involved, I would say. I would say so. <laughs> I also edited it and, little known fact, I did all 166 VFX shots on my own, so that was a long winter. So. Well, that's, that's quite some achievement. Uh, I'm Samantha Schnitzler and I play Ren Reed. Hi, I'm Alvin Adams. Uh, I was the executive producer and paid for the film um, and also had a bit cameo with two little ads. <laughs> How to. Um, Tom, well, let's, let's um, look, start off by looking at cast and crew. You ha seem to have like a little band of merry men and women who you work with continuously. Talk to us about why it's good to work with people on your... Yeah, well, I mean, this is my third feature film. Um, I actually wrapped my fifth one uh, on April 1st this year, so it's been a really full on... I mean, I've made them all since 2015. So, you know, they've been jumping budgets. You know, this was um, actually a really, really small budget uh, for, for a movie, but... Um, you know, they've just been going up and up. But I think the important thing about having a, a crew that you, you, you know, you trust and they trust you is that you can pull something like this off, you know, in, you know, 17 days or whatever it was for, you know, basically, you know, the, the catering budget for Tom Cruise was the, basically the whole budget for the film, you know. So, you know, when you've got a bunch of people around you, you know, really believe in what you're doing and, you know, you really trust them, then you know I think you get results, and the reality of filmmaking is, is it's not a it's not a one man job. You know the the sad thing is that yes the director gets all the credit or the blame at the back end, depending on whether people like it or hate it. But you know it actually takes us a, a small army of people to put this stuff together. You know I couldn't show up to set on my own and be like right movie go. It just doesn't work like that. You know so I think it's really good to surround yourself with people that that are experts at what they do or at least have the desire to become an expert at what they do because that means they'll work hard to get it done. So, yeah, I think, I think it's really important to surround yourself with, with people you trust. And, you know, they don't all move on to the film. I mean, the film we just finished was like a, you know, a free mill budget. So it's hard sometimes to make the sale where you're like, okay, I want to bring these people. But, you know, I'm, I'm sort of fiercely loyal and there's, there are people on the team that, you know, it's just a, a make or break. If you want to hire me, they've got to come. So I think it's super important to get this kind of thing done. I notice you become more, as, as you're progressing through your career, but you become more and more secretive about what you're up to. <laughs> Why is that so important? Yeah, I think when you're, when you're, you know, you're making the lower end stuff, you know, there's no such thing as an NDA and you don't, you know, you don't have, uh, you know, Stephen Moyer in the lead and stuff, you know, like we just did. And, it, you know, you kind of, you, the more people know about what you're doing, the better. But, you know, as you start to go up, like I just found out, you suddenly get slapped with all these NDAs and, you know, you can't speak about this and you can't talk about that. And it becomes this weird thing where I found it easy to just stay off my internet because I just want to post, oh, here's a bit from what I'm doing and keep people updated. It's, it's kind of a shame, really. I, I, I sort of miss this where we were so interactive with, you know, people that had followed me through Pandorica and Redwood to this one. You know, we were very interactive with, the, with them. And uh, it's, it's been a shame not being able to do that really on the, the last couple. But, you know, it's the way it goes. And I, I feel like, well, at least I've got this skill set now. You know, I can make films for this level of money. You know, and uh, I, I don't think I'll ever stop. I think it'll be one of these things where I just sporadically go, right, let's make a film for a low budget again, just because we can and we're in control of it, you know? You've got this amazing, well, obviously with the help of George. So the, the cinematographer for the film. Just, uh, just, just, just highlight that, George. Give a wave, George. I'm man. not. I don't just slag you up on the internet. <laughs> um, so, um, and I said this last year, and uh, I don't think Mike quite got what I was getting at, and that is that none of your films look like British films. They have a kind of American sometimes you know european feel about them it's you can almost does anyone else get what i mean you can almost watch an english film and know instantly it's an english film uh this has uh, particularly this uh redwood again just looked fantastic 
Um, any insight into how you achieve such a look? I, I think if a lot of it, I mean, me and George have been working together for, you know, 10, ten years now, and I couldn't do a, any of the stuff that we've pulled off about him. Um, but, you know, we've really developed this sort of visual language with each other. And, you know, it's funny sitting here and watching Black Side, you know, we've made two films since, and um, it's the first time I've seen it on the cinema in ages, and I've, I've just recently got glasses, so now I know what it actually looks like as well, which is amazing. Um, <coughs> But you know, it, it's it's funny how we're evolving, and you know, we started to incorporate a lot more grip and camera moves. And you know, on the last film, we had this 360 degree rig because we just made this space movie. And um, I think it's all about what you're inspired by. You know, like I'm I'm a big I'm proud to be a British filmmaker, and I'm proud to make films in Britain. But they've never been the movies that have necessarily inspired me. You know, and I've always wanted to make movies that I felt could. You know, sort of translate quite well. And, and like, if I'm being really honest, I'm quite a commercial, cheesy filmmaker, right? And it doesn't really sit that well with with um, British taste, if you will. You know, Britain's kind of known for its like grimy or you know a sort of uh, you know art house aesthetic. You know, and then I'm this guy that kind of like, wow, well, just like guys running around in masks with stormtrooper voices. It doesn't fit that mould very well. So it kind of makes sense to me to to try to fit into a market that you know probably you know suits the movies that I make a little better but in terms of putting them together you know it's it's really about I think just knowing what you're trying to achieve off the bat you know because I'm an editor like I can often see how the scene bolts together but while we're on set you know and that's what I'm trying to achieve and you know we get a lot of coverage on sets you know some people might say too much you know when you see the crew all on fire and collapse and need to go to hospital on day 17. Maybe, maybe too much, but it gives you all this stuff that you can edit with later. And I think, you know, the one thing I will say about British films is whenever I've been on other people's sets and I watch a lot of British movies, they don't seem to get a lot of coverage. It's like, this was the shot I wanted and that's what I'm gonna get. And, you know, and I think that gives you not a lot of options in, in post and American movies are like, with the, with the cuts and that's basically all I'm doing is really, you know, kind of quick paced cutting, so, which some people hate, but I like, so. Samantha, tell us about your journey with Tom Patton and, uh, you know, like how did you come to work with Tom and how has the transition been through all these films that you've worked with him on? Great. Um, I had been stalking Tom for a while on social media and, um, and pestering him saying, can you watch my reel? No, yeah, but that's how it started. You know, I connected with Tom. I had been um, seeing his work for a while and um, I thought it was probably someone I wanted to work with. Um, and um, we met and we talked and he told me about Black Sight and that he was looking for the lead actress and I was super excited. And I auditioned, it was like almost a two month process, I think, from the first audition to getting the phone call from Tom that said, hey, you got the job. So I was super happy. Um, I had read the first 45 pages of the script and I was hooked. I, I remember being on page 45 and being like, okay, yeah, yeah. oh, oh shit, there's nothing. Actually, I was scrolling down, it's the computer. But, um, and I couldn't wait to, to read the rest of it. And I, I absolutely loved the character. Um, so many things about her that that really draw me to her and um and yeah and we started working together and it was it was an awesome shoot uh my co-stars were fantastic the crew was great as well we we did a lot yeah we, we shot a lot in a very limited amount of time and i think that was a a, a test for a lot of people you know of, of, of strength of character but it was it was really really awesome we had a fantastic time i remember hearing people every day saying, I'm having the time of my life. And we really were, um, despite the location being super cold in the middle of August, you know, the crew was literally in ski jackets and, and there was like, you, when you see the breath, here's nothing, well, no special effects as far as I'm concerned, you know, we were actually seeing our breath and, and it was a bit crazy like that, but, um, but it was really awesome. I was going to ask you about, uh, working in deprived environments uh, because I remember overhearing some stories you had set telling the guys here about uh, some of the experiences you had working in Kidderminster and uh, the, because there was the way you were working, do, do I remember this correctly, there was no electricity, uh, is that correct? I mean, or, or limited yeah, electricity, uh, I mean, lighting. They, they, they brought it, but it's true that if you, uh, <laughs> if, if you were walking through the corridors, it was that weird thing that in the middle of the day, 
you extend your hand and you wouldn't see it. Like you, you literally wouldn't see past like this, this much. There was no light entering the building whatsoever. So it was a very, very different kind of experience. But the thing is, it got, I think their human brain is good because it, it adapts very quickly. And after a few days, it was just normal. And then, you know, a daily, a, an actor who would come for a day would come on set and be like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's the set. You know, we'd be totally used to it. Um, and, and yeah, like, you know, the, the crew did a fantastic job at lighting it, and given that there was barely any electricity, they had, like, a giant generator or something, and, yeah, they would just bring the light and some heating sometimes. And I mean, what people, I guess I guess what we should explain is that we actually shot this in a abandoned nuclear facility in Kidderminster, believe it or not. Um, there's a, we looked all over for one, and we found this, this place under Kidderminster that used to be uh, the um, Spitfire factory, and they built it in Kidderminster because they thought, well, the Germans don't know where fucking Kidderminster is, right? So, um, and then afterwards, it became that's why the, the tunnels are so big, so they can get the planes out, basically. Then it became a Rolls Royce factory for a little while, and then they turned it into the place where they would send the army in a, in a nuclear attack. And then it's been completely disused since the 90s, and we found it and was just like, well, ta da, no art department needed. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> basically how that happened. But it was. Middle of summer, red hot outside, but because that thing is, is like 50 meters underground or whatever, um, it's permanently six degrees Celsius in there, like permanently. Like it never goes up or down, that's it. So, just um, coming on to yourself. Yes, yes, because I know you're, you're, you're quite happy to be quite shy and sit up there quietly. What, yeah. what exactly? How exactly does Tom pitch to you an idea? Because I mean, I, I can just imagine Black Sight. Oh well, we've got these guys with masks and samurai swords in a bunker, and there's some gods and some lasers, perhaps, and some strange things. I mean, how exactly does he pitch an idea to you? All right. To be honest with you, um, I'm the one who went to him. <laughs> um, so, long story short, I always wanted to make. I've always wanted to make um, film and learn to make film. Um, uh, but since uh, my job, uh, I used to do. I used to work with Tom for years, doing photos and videos, and he used to do the festival stuff. Um, and I always wanted to make film, but uh, I, I got out of that industry uh, when I got a, a day job, so to speak. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to learn, and I saw what Tom was doing, um, and I thought, well, I've got the money, I might as well go to someone who I trust and know. Um, and it took a long time for actually for me to actually to get him to agree to make a film with me. I said, well, I'm going to make one anyway, so it's either with you or without you. And he's like, all right, okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, he came to me with a slate of five ideas, and he said, well, I think this is the one. Um, and I said, brilliant, yeah, okay, cool, I, I trust you. Um, fun fact for you, I didn't read the script. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had full trust in Tom. Um, I don't believe if you're ever going to pay someone to do something, don't, don't micromanage. So... All I need to know is how to make a film, not what the film was about. And, uh, one of my big theories is if a book's good enough, it'll be made into a film. So I was just so lucky enough to be making that film. So, yeah. Back to you, Tom. <laughs> now, you're quite modest, and I, I'm not quite sure how you're going to answer this. Um, how, how do you feel about these continual uh, comparisons between yourself and John Carpenter? I mean, it's ridiculous, because when he was, I mean, he's like, he's the master, right? Like, I'm, I'm just finding my feet, you know, and I think, it's funny, because I made Pandorica, the, the first film, you know, we just, we just shot this film in, in the woods in Billerica, you know, and, uh, and it, it did crazy well. I think it kind of surprised everybody how well it did, and, um, you know, and I wasn't really trying to emulate anything at that point, and, um, you know, and then when we did Redwood, the same stuff started happening, people were like, oh, he's like, He's like trying to be like John Carpenter or trying to be like Neil Marshall. You know, the two things kept coming up. And then, uh, you know, Redwood is a really sort of downbeat movie, you know? And it was a, a real, you know, it was it was kind of hellish to shoot as well. So with, with Black Sight, you know, um, when Alvin came and spoke to me, you know, this, this concept was supposed to be, well, I mean, it still is. We're working very hard on, a, on an animated version of it now uh, as a reboot because it's so mythology heavy, right? This is so much packed in, oh, probably too much, to be honest, um, you know, for this one thing. So we're sort of, you know, branching out. But um, yeah, just decided to em embrace it and be like, right, okay, let's just, if we just make an elegant John Carpet a homage, then maybe that'll put that to bed and we don't have to talk about that anymore. 
Um, you know, and it's funny because I think on Stairs and, and G Lock, which are the two films I've just wrapped, you know, you saw the trailer for Stairs there and, and G Lock. It was like, I almost felt like do, doing Black Side let me almost put a, a lid on that and, you know, try something different. And I think Stairs and, and G Lock, although they, they, you can still tell I made them, I think, you know, hopefully we're, you know, between myself and Georgia coming up with a, okay, that's one of their films, they made that. Um, but yeah, it's evolving and trying to become, you know, more of a. I'd love, a, I'd love a day where people don't say the carpet thing. I mean, this one you're supposed to very clearly. There's no way around it. That's what we wanted to do. But you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But no, I mean, I'm. I, the guys are, are god, right? Like you know, it's 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 a ridiculous comment. People, people say it. I think so. Uh, the only reason I asked the question is I put a post up on Facebook about Shane Black's site and the first three things that came up was, oh, this is supposed to be like a John Carpenter <laughs> film. Like three different people, completely isolated. Well, I mean, um, it is. It's packed, it's packed full of John. Yeah. I mean, the, the font at the beginning, yeah. the, the whole beginning thing is, uh, you know, Escape from New York, just, you know, retooled for what we're doing and some colour changes so I don't get sued. Uh, you know, but I think what, what I was trying to do with this was go, okay, well, let's take all the John Carpenter trappings but then rather than you know make an escape from New York or whatever, we'll do a completely unique story, you know, and try and, and fit that in. And um, I don't know, I think we've, think we've got away with it. I think there's an escape from Kidderminster. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what, I, if, I, if there was ever going to be an English version of that, it would be an escape from Kidderminster. We were there for three weeks, and I'm not joking, the best thing to do in Kidderminster is the carpet museum. That's a real thing. Someone woke up one day and said, I'm going to open a carpet museum and put in kind of it stuff. Oh, if only Natalie was in here, she'd be all over that. <laughs> um, so my next question, and it would be stupid of me not to ask this question, tell us a bit about Stairs. So uh, Stairs is the movie that we shot last summer, and um, you know, it, well, I, I, you know, basically the movie is about um, eight mercenaries who are, you know, they're private hire soldiers basically. They get sent to a, a civil conflict they're not supposed to be in, and their mission is to um, collect all this intel at a base camp and kill anybody that's there. And uh, they go, and they find a civilian prisoner, and they sort of argue amongst themselves about whether they should kill the prisoner or not, but you know, the orders are orders, and so they shoot this woman in the head. And when they get back to HQ in the, in the UK, uh, the lifts are broken, and so they get on the stairs, and there's no doors, there's no windows, and uh, the, the stairs just go up forever. And if they go down, they're killed. So they're forced to just keep climbing and climbing and climbing. And then eventually, they do find a door, but the door leads to 10 minutes before they committed the crime. So it becomes a, a, a sort of a, a them versus their younger self situation. But it's a um, super weird film, very, very different from Black Sight. I mean, it's, it's really, really, really dark, um, you know, and uh, intentionally a bit ambiguous. So. We tried something different with it, and you know it's very stylistic. Maybe people will love it, maybe they won't. But I mean, we got a lot of help from uh, Spencer here because uh, one of our locations fell through at the last second, the stairs. And so Spencer let us shoot in the stairs right behind this cinema. So the whole movie actually is shot back here. Uh, Billy here was our clapper guy for a while, so we were very involved with um, you know Mercury Shopping Centre, and, and those guys really, really helped us out and bent over backwards. So make that happen so I'll definitely be bringing that here as soon as we're ready. And then uh, I should also ask, I know you're probably going to be quite tight-lipped about this, but what can you tell us about G-Lock? Um, yeah, basically G-Lock is a space movie, um, something I've always wanted to do, you know, my first real big budget film. Um, we got Stephen Moyer from True Blood in the lead and Casper Van Dien from Starship Troopers as the villain. And uh, it's it's, ba it's basically set on a world where, uh, you know, it's Earth, it, but it's like, this is kind of the peak of Earth, if you will, and from here on out, it's all downhill. And this, this gateway has shown up in, in Earth's orbit, and it leads to another Earth-like planet. But for every one year on Earth, 18 go by on the other side. And so for the early immigrants that take off, uh, by the time our main character goes over 32 years later, it's been 584 years on that side, and they've kind of become like America, and they've decided, uh, even though we're immigrant descendant, we don't want to let any more immigrants down. And so they keep all the earthers on this refugee station, and it kind of becomes a, it's basically Venezuelans trying to cross the American border in space, and it's a 
how would you like it to uh, anybody that kind of, you know, because I think this is it when you, when you do, it, you know, immigration films are a, t a difficult subject to tackle for a white person. So all I tried to do was make a film where I go, well, you know, to other white people, why don't you put yourself in th their shoes and, you know, think carefully before you say stupid stuff on Facebook. Um, so that's kind of what, what that <coughs> film is. Uh, but it's, it, like I say, it's, it's, it's much bigger budget than anything ever done before. It's kind of strange doing this big VFX film. And one of the main characters is a, an artificial intelligence stick man. It's weird. It's good though. I like it. So. Uh, yeah, we got John Rhys Davis who promptly left the set and then went and insulted people on uh, Question Times. So that was funny. <laughs> Um, so, um, Black Sight is pretty much finished with the festival cir circuit now. Yeah, you're it? the last one. And so what is happening with it now? It came out on wide release in America uh, in April and has done really, really well over there. So, whew, good, that was good news. And then uh, it comes out here on, I think, September the 2nd is the date I've just been given. So, but we'll call it TBC. But it's, it's around, it's around then for the UK release and we'll do small theatrical run but it'll you know primarily target you know home, home dvd blu-ray uh, vod and uh, and then maybe off to the horror channel or something like that who knows um have we got any questions out there uh, i think the, the the high point for for me was actually getting it all done on schedule uh, you know, because there was moments there where it, it didn't look like it was going to happen, and you know, it was, it was getting super, super tight in terms of crunch phase. And there was one day where we were supposed to have tons and tons and tons of extras show up, and uh, they didn't. And um, so I quickly had to come up with this idea. Where, well, I'd watched the video on the making of John Wick, and they do a thing called bearding in John Wick, where you know they've actually only got like ten stuntmen. And you know, when John Wick kills one guy, he'll drop down and take his beard off and stand back up and he's a new, a new opponent. So we took the extras that we did out and any crew members that we could and you know, we basically built their wardrobe up so that they're wearing tons of layers. And as they go down one corridor, they'll quickly take their hat off and reappear and then take off their top layer. And so what, when it looks like there's loads of people walking around, there's, there's like six of them total. So that was, that was a pretty high point. And a low point for me was when in the finale, uh, Phoebe, who's playing the villain, actually punched Sam in the face for real. And uh, uh, yeah, I thought the filming was done then, but you, you know, he took it like a champ, right? So just carried on. <laughs> and um, how was that for you? <laughs> the film or the punch in the face? The punch in the face. Right, right, right. Oh, highest point in the film, yeah. yeah. Definitely, <laughs> stars and everything. Now, I mean, you know, these things happen. And, you know, Tom being, you know, very, well, caring with his actors and everything, obviously he's going to be like, oh, shit, no, 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 no. But it, it just happens, you know, when you fight on camera. And the great thing is Phoebe and I are actually great friends in reality. And what Tom doesn't say is the day before, I actually caught her finger with, like, the, the shaft of my sword. And it, it's, it's, it's not cool, but it happens, you know. And when you trust the person you're doing the fight with, then it's fine. It's not a big deal, you know. You don't have it at the back of your mind. Is she trying to get me out of the film to get the limelight or something? Never, ever. So it's just, you know, just it happens. It's cool. Like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> we just covered that just one. Covered that <laughs> one. <laughs> Come on, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away, <laughs> mate. <laughs> It's a good job he's a really good cinematographer, yeah. isn't it? Um, <coughs> I did have another question. Completely thrown me now. Have you got like a time we have to like get a certain amount of time on the video? Is that what it is? No, 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 no. We can cut, we can cut this off at any point in time. Thank you very much.